uh, Brain Juicer claim to have accurately, or being the only research company to have accurately predicted what happened in Brexit. And uh, here to tease us with why that might have been, Alex, over to you. So, thank you very much. So, let's start with the really important and vital uh, stuff that you're all desperately hoping to understand, which is, of course, my first slide, and why did we stop listening, um, and what if the hypothesis was wrong? What if we didn't actually stop listening, we just listened to the wrong stuff? Uh, and I will try and explain uh, why uh, maybe it wasn't a failure to listen, it was just listening to the wrong bits. So what are we really dealing with? Well, the harsh reality of what appears to have happened um, is polling got it wrong. Yeah, and polling has relentlessly got it wrong pretty much since the first polls happened. It's almost exactly 100 years to the year. 1916, uh, first political poll in the US uh, on the back of the Reader's Digest. Um, but they appear to have got it wrong relentlessly since then on many, many occasions, uh, leading to this famous uh, headline in the paper where they believed the polls, uh, and then when you woke up in the morning, Truman was president and not Dewey after all. Uh, and who wants that stain on their career as the, you know, editor who went to press uh, with the headline that turned out to be completely wrong? Now, um, if you listen to me, as you will unfortunately be forced to do for at least another 10 minutes, um, I have four teenage children, you know, dad in arse shock um, predicts things wrongly, uh, does not generate much in the way of headlines in our household, yeah? The contempt with which my opinions can be held uh, by four teenage children is fairly staggering to believe, um, and that's true even in audiences like this, yeah? We start mainly with our own opinions. Uh, and we don't really give too much of a noggin about anyone else's. And that harsh truth is true. So let's have a think uh, about two ways in which you could look at this differently. So instead of asking people who they're going to vote for, what if you applied some of the thinking that you undoubtedly have to asking the questions in different ways that might get you different answers that might turn out to be more predictive? Because let's face it, the only reason anyone does any research is to try and predict outcomes. And the harsh reality is if we keep demonstrating that we're pretty crap at it, predicting those outcomes, um, then this is potentially a flaw for the entire £40 billion industry of which I am a small, tiny, microscopic dot uh, on its arse, as my children would politely point out. So let's look at the lens of fame, feeling and fluency first, OK? Now, the truth is, having spent a lot of time looking at brand trackers, having been even the CMO, who uh, was presented to many times in rooms by people showing me the millions of pounds worth of research that I'd paid for on my tracker, uh, we spent at Brainjuicer uh, quite a lot of time trying to think uh, if we do actually make most decisions in life uh, very quickly, using fast and frugal decision-making, then what should you actually have in your tracker that would be most useful, that would tell you whether you were muffing things up or doing well? And after a lot of painstaking thought, we came up with the searing intellect of these three because we figured most people can only remember in threes. Uh, if you make it fives, about 20% less people can remember. And if you make it sevens, it's about 70% less people can remember anything you're talking about. So I will try and uh, deal with that. And the truth is, even today, I will conclude uh, at the end, and you will remember almost nothing about what I have told you. Um, and you will go home largely believing the things you believed before you came in the room. Um, and all you will really be able to remember is whether you ever want to see me again and kind of how you felt about this evening, uh, of which I will also be a small and microscopic part. Um, so the reality is, when we think about brands, if a brand comes easily to mind, it must be a good idea. That's pretty much the heuristic we use for a lot of our choosing. Um, if I feel good about a brand, it must be a good choice uh, as a second heuristic. And then the last one, if I recognise a brand quickly. Yeah, and recognition's really important in life. In a crowd like this, you will walk into the room and you will be glancing around for the other people that you know, the other people that you recognise, and the speed of that recognition is really important. And having someone else stood next to you telling you who it is because you couldn't recognise them from last time, um, you know, it's fine, I've lost a stone, it's OK, there's no obligation on you to recognise me from before, um, but that's the reality of what kind of, like, happens, OK? So if we then uh, apply that to politics, the truth is, not that this works perfectly in the case of Brexit, I'll explain why it's not relevant, um, but if we looked at the US election, if a politician comes easily to mind, they must be a good choice, fame matters. The same with feeling, if I feel good about them. And then the last one, fluency. What are the distinctive assets that that 
politician, that brand has. It's the same stuff. So how might you go about measuring this? We're desperate people, but we're researchers, and at some point you have to turn it into a number, otherwise people feel that you're failing miserably in your job, uh, unless you're a brilliant qualitative researcher, in which case they just trust you implicitly with everything that you say. Um, so in fame terms, we started with what percent of a nationally representative sample would you know, but the real interesting introduction here is time pressure. If you put a big clock on the screen, like I have a little clock counting down in front of me, if you put a clock counting down in seconds in front of people, they make quicker decisions. Uh, they feel the pressure of time. Yeah, the countdown, bit -up, bit -up, bit -up, bit -up, that really matters. So you basically want that if you're trying to work out what realistically people are choosing. The same, we use these faces. Apologies if you've not seen the brain juice of faces before. Um, there will be many of you who've probably never even heard of us before, and that's fine too. But the reality is we've been using them for a long time. They're based on the work of a guy called Paul Ekman, and we actually invented neutral as a face. Uh, Paul Ekman never talks about neutrality. Uh, and we've discovered that actually neutrality is fundamentally much more important than we ever thought when we started. We just wanted to have an emotion that you could feel if you thought you didn't feel anything. Yeah, it was that sophisticated. Um, and then the last one, uh, trying to do under time pressure, distinctive asset tests, recognition. How quickly do people recognise the different assets? OK, so that's really how we measure it. So what does it mean? Well, what's interesting about this slide is not the prediction that we made. This is January the 7th. So in January the 7th, Bernie was a really plausible candidate uh, and Donald Trump was never, ever going to win. Uh, I can find you, if you want, lots of press articles uh, saying how he would never will the nomination, how the Republican Party machinations would prevent him from even getting close to it. But the reality was, when you looked at it at the time, on fame, uh, weirdly, on negative feeling, these are the two most hated uh, political candidates we've ever tested in anything we've ever done, and we only started doing this because we felt that, you know, there was a danger that polling was giving a market research bad name. Um, but the reality is, even in January, we're saying it's Clinton v Trump and the rest is a sideshow. Now, fortuitously, as is ever the way of these things, that actually turned out to be true. Um, and this is really what happened. If you looked at the fame, feeling and fluency, apologies, these are Nightingale charts for those of you who don't spend your life in market research land. So how close to the edge uh, is really what matters. Um, but trust me, it doesn't really matter that much. I will hopefully painfully explain to you uh, what I'm trying to tell you. Um, but the reality is Carly Fiorina, Chris Christie, Ben Carson, Jeb Bush, Marco Rubio, these were all no mark, no hopers, and they all dropped out of the race, uh, leaving Ted Cruz to carry the flag. Um, against uh, Donald Trump uh, and at that point there weren't so many people predicting that Donald Trump wouldn't be the Republican nominee. Yeah? Now the reality is what actually happened is really it was a fame game. Yeah? Under time pressure, correct attribution of the pictures of who are these people. Um, Hillary has a narrow lead, Donald Trump is second. Uh, you can see Bernie, Ted, Marco all a bit lower down. Who do we think comes in third? Yeah, I won't uh, humiliate you by uh, making any of you actually guess. The harsh reality is it's Donald Trump's hair. Yeah? You can chop the rest of his face off and just put his ridiculous barnet on a picture and more people recognise it than any of the other candidates in the election. And at this point, we were fairly comfortable uh, that when it came to fame, Donald was probably going to do quite well. Yeah? Uh, ridiculousness does not appear to be a problem. Uh, in certain environments, and maybe that's going to become truer when we talk about Brexit in a minute. So what actually happened in the Brexit vote? And I think the honest truth in our model, and you can't test it perfectly because it's not really about fame, everyone was kind of dealing with it, but we think there are four significant things that the uh, uh, levers, that the Brexiteers had that really were the aces in their card game uh, uh, against those who were in favour of Remain. And they were these. They had better slogans. Take back control. Who hasn't wanted in their life to take back control? I am a fat middle-aged lard ass who doesn't do enough exercise. I want to take back control of my life and reduce myself to the, you know, fantastically handsome 20-year-old I once deludedly believed I was. You know, this is the reality. We all want to take back control. Uh, however minor, however trivial, uh, we all have have that kind of like sense. The same when it comes to issues, you know, immigration, sovereignty. We may have felt we could trivialise some of these, but actually that's not really how it worked. 
They were very clear, you know, saying, uh, as absolutely not one person did, uh, as a historian, I certainly believe this, you know, we lived in a situation where there's been a war in Europe since about 1280, pretty much every 30 years, and we've now not had one for about 70. Yeah, so we've doubled our average. Yeah, having been married for 23 years now, I keep telling my wife this is double the average for a marriage in the UK, uh, and she looks at me with the contempt that that information deserves. Um, so the reality in these kind of situations, we double our long-term average on not having wars, um, but we never seem to have had that discussion. No one raised those issues. They're out there and they beat us. The memes. I mean, who hasn't heard the stuff about straight bananas, you know, migrants on benefits, people getting more to live in posh houses in central London, and, you know, all of these things that the Daily Mail adores with every fibre of its being and uses to make us go on their damn website and read their newspapers against our better judgement and our high moral fibre that appears to be impervious uh, to their kind of, you know, BuzzFeed nonsense that somehow draws us in despite our better judgement. That's the reality. They had much better memes and whatever we may joke about now, £350 million a week was a masterstroke. Uh, whoever put that on the bus, uh, genius. Yeah, that's the reality. That kind of stuff, we can argue about whether it was a lie, um, but, you know, at some basic level, my whole life's a lie. Um, you know, it's just what you live with, yeah? Um, what kind of self-hatred and loathing can you cope with on a daily basis? And talking of self-hatred and loathing, we had Boris and Farage. Um, Boris so overwhelmed after the vote by the realisation of what he'd done, uh, that he basically had to fall on his sword and admit that it was a feckless and stupid thing to do, and everything he'd written in advance said that it was a stupid and feckless thing to do and he secretly never thought he'd win. Um, you know, that's the kind of craven, uh, pathetic uh, stuff that we're all capable of at a human level uh, and he was no different to anyone else. But frankly, Boris and Farage, probably better known than anyone I saw on Question Time, uh, I saw on any of the news bulletins in advance, yeah? The celebrity quotient of the Remainers was pathetically piss poor, yeah? So, the reality is, for them to have had a chance, for Remain to have had a chance, they had to find some distinctive elements themselves, and, frankly, it was pretty below average, yeah? Um, I've already used the word piss poor, so I'm going to hope I'm going to get away without too much being dragged from the stage for uh, using bad language, as I would have been in my Royal Mail days. That kind of language would have instantly got me uh, uh, thrown off the stage. So, why stories? So, we've dealt with the, the theory of fame, feeling and fluency. We've seen why the fluency of uh, uh, the Remainers campaign was abject in the face of the fluency of the uh, Brexiteers. Um, so what about stories? And this is a, a very good book, Jonathan Haidt, if you've not read it. Uh, the human mind's a story processor, not a logic processor, OK? So we basically reduce most of the choices in life to some kind of narrative that we can vaguely understand. And I'm hugely indebted to the work of a guy called Christopher Booker, who wrote a book called The Seven Basic Plots. Again, you don't have to read it. We've summarised for you here. Uh, these are the seven chapter headings, roughly, of his excellent work. And he looks at novels, kids' stories, uh, everything from around the world, and reduces them in a nice simplistic format to these seven basic plots. That's why the book, politely, is called Seven Basic Plots. Very kind of him to say it as it is, yeah? Um, and the reality is they are the reduction uh, of those plots. And what is, when you do this kind of research, you basically show people this stuff and you ask them, what's the current story? What do you think is the best story now? Yeah? And then you ask them, what story would you like it to be? What is the optimal outcome? What is the best kind of story you can imagine uh, for the situation in which you find yourself? And the reality was, the current story was comedy. Okay? Despite all its mistakes and problems, we'll be fine in the long term. Yeah? That was pretty much what we uh, had as the best option beforehand. And the optimal story, the hope is that we would turn into this wonderful quest narrative that we'd thrive in the 21st century. That was what people were hoping the outcome would be. Now, I won't expect you to look at all of this. You can actually have the charts if you really want to go and pour over them later. Um, but the reality is here are the two stacked up, where on the left you basically have people saying the story could come true. That's what they're kind of like hoping. Then you have a most versus least believable story. And then you have how do they feel about the story on an emotional kind of scale. OK, so that was the same kind of emotional scale we showed you before. OK? And what that really kind of uh, led us to was a belief of what was actually happening. 
So what came out in the research, and we wrote this uh, uh, kind of like afterwards, all of these are verbatims. All the orange text are things that came straight out of people filling in verbatims when they were asked. So you're asked how you feel and why, and we just plucked words out of their whys uh, and strung a few, and some say, or buts, uh, in between them uh, to make a narrative. And it's amazing how uh, easily that seems to read. So this isn't us scribing away. This is uh, real respondents, uh, admittedly online, in the privacy of their bedrooms, where they may have been wearing their underpants. Who knows? Um, but the reality is this is real uh, consumer language kind of strung together to turn into those two stories. Yeah from an earlier kind of like test that we did. So these are what the two stories kind of meant to people in terms of the current and the optimal kind of like version. And what actually happened was we then got people uh, uh, having discussed the stories first, we then asked them, uh, who do you think you're going to vote for? And then we split them uh, and had a look at, you know, who's claiming which story as their own. Uh, and the interesting thing was neither Remain nor Leave really had a big advantage on the two that everyone was I identifying as the kind of primary ones. But there were definitely stories where the Leave Brexiteers had a much stronger uh, kind of like version. Things like Overcoming the Monster uh, is quite a well-known one. I would have expected them to win on that, but maybe not by the margins that they're winning it on here. So which are the stories where, you know, Boris's charming face was uh, ahead of, uh, of David Cameron's? Um, and this was then when you look at the levers. Uh, actually, this was really just looking at their words then on the same story uh, and just seeing a little bit more about what that narrative means to them. What are the words that they're using and how would you try and combat this? And I wish, uh, it's very easy to say that belatedly as a staunch Remainer, that we'd done a bit more with this research. But to be honest, we were just doing it for ourselves for fun, uh, to provide ourselves with something to write about on our blog. Um, and, uh, you know, it's one of the abject truths uh, of our lives that you suddenly realise the futility of what you've done uh, and maybe how you could have used it to maybe get a better or different outcome. And what was really scary about all of this in the middle of this was, of course, as I said, we'd asked people uh, which outcome they would choose. Uh, and what was interesting about that um, was much more uh, this prediction. So this is three and a half weeks out uh, from Brexit. Um, and we're saying 54% against 46%. And what we haven't done is just tally up who's voted. What we've actually done is provide a kind of shoulder on how quickly you chose. So when you make choices in life, if you're certain, you make them really quickly. If you're less certain, you make them more slowly. In a polling booth, it is impossible for you to tell this. But online, with clicky, clicky, mousy, mousy, when you have enough people, it actually is pretty clear how quickly people are making those choices. We even have a mild adjustment for how speedy you are on your trigger finger on your mobile phone versus when you're sitting there with a mouse. Um, and uh, we have even tried a few adjustments to allow for decrepitude and age, in my case, uh, as a way sometimes of seeing whether it really matters on a, a age breaks to have a look. But this is really a speed-based choice. And the only reassuring factor uh, we have uh, in looking at this, and in, what was it in the end, 52, 48 or whatever it was, the only reassuring factor we have in, in looking at all of this when I, I consider it is that on the same basis, uh, at the moment, uh, it still looks like Hillary will win, uh, although it's a hell of a lot closer uh, than I would hope. So, um, getting to our optimal story, we were just talking about three acts. One is sometimes trying to understand it, define it, trying to prove it's true, and then trying to tell that story as effectively as you can. And I think not enough uh, political debate sometimes focuses on trying to do that as simply as possible. And why doesn't enough debate happen? Well, apologies for showing you one of the oldest and probably one of the best uh, political ads of all time. But the truth is, actually, Andrew Rutherford wrote brilliantly uh, in a book on the topic of polling and elections and communications that the truth is the floating voter is not sat down at home poring over the party manifesto he's making his mind up based on broad impressions and we were experts at creating broad impressions and that's the reality what happened in the brexit uh, vote was that the remainers were really crap at creating broad impressions and faced between what looks like two crappy choices we take much more risk than we're faced between a good choice and a bad choice and that's what failed, that's what went wrong, I think, in Brexit, is it looked like two shit choices. Yeah? And in that context, everyone goes, well, what the hell? Don't mind which of the two shit ones I've got. 
Um, and so no uh, debate was made to help that work. So what am I really saying in a kind of final learning? The purpose of research is prediction, and if your predictions are not working, then maybe you need to ask some different questions in different ways. Thank you.